2019 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council would, uh, would please have the roll call. Chairman Garvin? Here. Councillor Adams? Here. Councillor Devereaux? Here. Councillor Gabrielson? Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Councillor Penelope Jordan? Here. And Councillor Straw? Here. Thank you very much. Would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Are there any councillors with any reports or correspondence at this point? Councilor Devereaux. Uh, first, I'd just like to um, mention that some of you may have noticed that our councillor Randall is now Councillor Adams. Uh, she's a newlywed, and I'd like to con the whole council would like to congratulate her on her marriage. Thank you. And thank you for moving up in the roll call. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice switch. <laughs> uh, second, I attended our um, Bridges of Friendship photography exhibit that was at the Thomas Memorial Library. It was a, a celebration of our 30th anniversary of um, s celebrating this 30th anniversary with our sister city, Archangel, in Russia. So there was uh, photography from um, photographers here in Cape and other greater Portland cities along with Archangel, Russia. They presented us with a letter um, that's dated July 14th, 1987, an original letter from the town of Cape Elizabeth um, that um, established this relationship. And so I wanted to bring that and give that to the council. And I'd really like to thank um, Dan Glover and Dennis Morot for putting together a wonderful exhibition and um, continuing this friendship with our sister city in, in Russia. I also have one more uh, announcement, we have um, uh, a Maine Bicentennial Celebration Committee that we're putting together. At our last town council meeting, the council approved the formation of the Maine Bicentennial Celebration Committee. Um, and later this evening, the council will consider the committee charge. The charge calls for a committee of five people, appointee, an appointee of the town council, school board and the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society. In addition, there's uh, would be an appointment for two residents of Cape Elizabeth in this process. So in order to move forward with the applications, the, they are on our website, correct? So the, the website has these applications. The deadline to submit them is this Friday, the 18th, and the committee will be from December 1st, 2019, to December 1st, 31st, 2020. The nominations will be forwarded to the town council for our November meeting. So I'd like to encourage anyone who's interested in the main centennial celebration to um, come aboard, help us with that. We're also in the process of our annual appointments. So applications are being accepted now for positions on various town boards and committees. So I'd ask that any interested residents apply at um, capeelizabeth.com. That deadline is 4 p.m. November 1st. Those nominations will be forwarded to the town council in December. So again, I'd really like to encourage you to, um, to join a committee. It's, um, as you can see, it's a wonderful process and we really enjoy having other residents being involved on the committees. So please join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to um, echo that point. I think at least three, if not four, of the current members of the council have all served on committees in town. Um, and uh, it's a great way to be involved. And if you have any questions or interest, don't hesitate to reach out to either the council or anybody on those committees currently. Uh, or who has served in the past. I know that everybody who does serve is more than happy to um, relay their experience and tell you about the commitment that's involved. In many cases, it's not too much of a commitment. So if it's something that's of interest, please don't hesitate to come forward. Uh, we appreciate everybody's time and service of their talents. Any other reports or correspondence? Seeing none, we'll move on to the... I have an yep. additional item. So, I. Um, I was wondering if Councillor Garvin was going to bring this up. 
At our last um, workshop meeting on September 24th, we had a town council workshop meeting. Before the meeting began, I um, asked Councillor Garvin about two emails that I received that came from his Cape Elizabeth um, email. They were regarding the school's building committee. Uh, he said that he hadn't sent them to me, so I showed them to him. Um, our town manager and town clerk were both present at that at that meeting, and he looked at him and said that he did not um, send those emails. So I'm um, very concerned that we may have a hacking issue with our town council emails. The um, emails came directly, it looked like it came directly from his town council email. There were several people that were um, on that email list that had all been on the needs assessment committee. Um, one person that I've talked to said that she actually received the email also. So I, I, so I, I think I'm aware of what the problem is actually. So it had are. to do with the calendaring function and how I replied to that calendar invite. Uh, so that's what generated the response, and I didn't realize okay, that that's what had happened. So. It, it got me worried that yep. maybe we had been hacked and no. we needed um, some to look at that. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, Matt and I had followed up after the fact, and um, sorry for not updating you further on it, but yeah, so in, as most people are probably used to with email and calendaring functions, you can craft an email or reply to a calendar invite, and that's what... When, when I declined that, that's what prompted uh, okay. that. Okay, so, yep. all right, thank you yep. for clarifying that. Thank you that. for remembering that. Anything else? Seeing none, we'll move on to the Finance Committee report. Councilor Straw. So you should all have uh, the dashboard and the various financial reports, including the appropriation control, the expense distribution, the revenue control, and the revenue distribution. Uh, I wanted to highlight uh, two things this month. Uh, so first off, um, if you look at the dashboard, you'll note with our revenues, uh, between the various revenues um, coming into the various uh, funds and whatnot, we're running about 600000 ahead of where we were last year uh, already for revenue, and we're only in this is through the end of September. So. Um, just wanted to highlight that we're doing well from that perspective. Uh, the other uh, item I wanted to flag is the revenue um, distribution, which basically lists um, transaction after a transaction after a transaction. I just wanted to highlight uh, the good work of the town manager and the finance director. I noted <laughs> uh, th this is really getting into the nitty gritty, but um, the things going on behind the scenes that um, most people will never notice. Uh, we've begun tracking a number of our transactions on a daily basis as opposed to grouping together deposits on a weekly or uh, mm -hmm. bi-weekly basis and it makes for keeping track of what's going on a lot easier. So uh, I just wanted to highlight that. I, I, I saw it. I'm aware of it. I appreciate it. I recognize the hard work you guys are doing behind the scenes. So thank you for that. So with that said, anyone oh, anyone have any questions? Matt, is there anything you want to add? Just, just one item of, of, of I guess, Information that I'd like to point out, and it's specific to the revenues at the uh, with that pay and display that's been generated uh, at at the fort. Uh, currently, through the month of September, we're at $226,700 of revenue. That's net revenue. Uh, our anticipated amount that we're looking to receive was 300000 So once we get through the month of October and book that revenue, we should be close to or at goal for the year, uh, but with two months left to go as well with May and June in the next calendar year, but still in the same fiscal year. So there's been a lot of great work uh, that's, that's taken place there from a lot of different folks on our staff, including Bob Malley, Chris Cutter, who's here mm -hmm. this evening as well, and Kathy Raftis and the, all the staff down at the fort. They've done a really good job helping people get up to speed with that and uh, have made this really a successful implementation of the program, and uh, uh, it shows in the numbers. So we're very pleased with that, to, to report on that on the dashboard. So we'll update that again as we go through. But after this month, November 1st, the pay and display ceases for the winter time. So. Uh, we should have our hard numbers shortly thereafter, if not the November uh, council meeting. We'll have them wrapped up at least for the calendar year for the December council meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions for either Council Straw or Matt? Anything else you want to add, Chris? Nope, that's it. Great, thank you very much. Um, next up is an item, uh, opportunity for any citizens here wishing to speak to something that is not on tonight's agenda. Is there anybody here that wishes to speak to anything not currently on our agenda? 
seeing none, we'll go to the town manager's monthly report. Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'll try to be brief looking at the size of this evening's agenda and knowing that you have a lot of work to do, but there's some important information to bring forward. And uh, first and foremost <coughs> is that fall cleanup is ongoing with disposal fees being waived for residential users at their recycling facility from October 12th to the 28th. And as of this Sunday, the 20th, the recycling center will be open on Sundays until November 10th. So uh, we'll try to work within our resident schedule. Take advantage of the opportunity while you may. There for, will be, uh, the Ford lawn and waste. Yeah, for lawn and bulky waste. Not for, waste. Yeah, service. not for the, yeah, not for, sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, important point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Yeah, for, uh, you know, to help get rid of your yard waste. That's, that does accumulate right now and probably there'll be more on the ground after tomorrow, <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, there will be an informational meeting next Wednesday on phase three of the Scott Dyer Road reconstruction project. Uh, that'll be at 7 p.m. here at the Town Hall. Uh, absentee voting is also being, is, is open now here at the Town Hall and it will be until October 31st. And uh, last week, uh, Deborah Lane and I took the opportunity to sit down with Superintendent Wolfram to discuss uh, security issues and concerns during the election process. Uh, over the next year, uh, There'll be three different, actually, if you count November 5th, there'll be four elections that will take place, or four voting opportunities that will take place. We have November 5th election, which will be uh, coming up. Schools will be closed on that day, but then there'll also be a... Um, uh, primary. Primary, sorry, thank you. It's at a loss for words. There'll be a primary in March. Uh, the schools will be open on that day. And then there'll also be uh, the school voting in June, or the, our annual voting in June. And then again, the presidential election, which will take place next November. Out of those, uh, the students will be in session on a couple of those different days. So what we're looking to do is try to find a way to provide a greater level of security because it, it does take place at the high school in the gymnasium. So we're, we're meeting with uh, Chief Fenton this week to come up with some strategies that'll help uh, due to some concerns that came up from inside of the facility and trying to contain voters within, within the area that we need to have and also to manage parking because we did run into an issue last year during the June vote with, when there was a lacrosse game that was scheduled at the same, playoff game scheduled at the same time as the vote was taking place. And in the evening, it filled the parking lots. So it, some residents expressed their frustration. So we're trying to look at parking management and those types of issues going forward. So uh, if you see additional security this November 5th at the schools, please don't be alarmed. We're just trying to find a few different ways to test and adjust to see what would be the best method to use in, in that situation. That being said, uh, the winter is coming and our animals out there are, uh, are interested in a lot of different things to get ready for winter. I had an interesting conversation with uh, Jerry Vilstein, who is a conservation biologist. She did a presentation uh, a couple weeks ago at the library regarding uh, specifically to coyotes. And she called me as a follow-up to express her concern and wanted, to, wanted me to convey to folks, please do not feed the wild animals because that gives them bad habits. They come thinking that humans are equal to food and uh, there's a lot of you know, transmission for rabies that will take place and it brings you a greater level of exposure than you should. So we'll have an informational article up on the website shortly following up from uh, our conversation that I had with her. And finally, I would like to say and take the opportunity to congratulate uh, Jeff Gadette of the Cape Elizabeth Police Department who today was promoted to sergeant. So it was a very significant uh, advancement for Jeff and we're, we, uh, we were over at his swearing in where Deborah swore him in and we had a nice event at the, at the fire department. So congratulations to Jeff, he's been here for I think 18 years and uh, it's quite an honor for him and we look forward to having him for much longer. So that's my report, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much, any questions for Matt? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, review of the draft minutes of the meeting held September 9th, 2019. Is there a motion to approve the minutes as included in the agenda? So moved. Councilor Straw, is there a second? Second. Councilor Jen Jordan, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Next up, um, we have a number of agenda items that uh, we're gonna try something uh, that we haven't done regularly, but it's a consent agenda or consent calendar. So for items number 136 through number 142, uh, we're gonna present the opportunity for the council to vote on those and block uh, in the interest of moving the meeting along and um, most of these are of an administrative nature. Any counselor has the opportunity to ask that any of these items be considered separately. So I'll ask that at this time. I think, Councilor Jordan. 
I think uh, one of them needs to be considered separately because there's an error. Which one is that? On, I think this goes with, because it's one part of 141. Uh, it's the one uh, that talks about the referral of uh, items to the ordinance committee, et cetera, items 30 through 82. And there's an 86 and not an 82 that refers to uh, the uh, ordinance committee looking at administrative tracking for short-term rentals. So I think it needs So I was gonna suggest for different reasons that number 141 just be separated altogether anyway. Um, okay. So regardless of the okay. housekeeping, it, okay. uh, things, my was, recommendations. Yeah, there was pull something that else I needed to Is talk there anything about. else that anybody yeah. wants to pull out? Yes, I'd like to pull out um, item 140. 140? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so items 140 and 141 will be considered individually. Uh, remaining are items number 136 through 139. Uh, I will give the public a moment to uh, uh, comment on any of these in just a second. I first want to disclose that on item 136, um, that these properties are uh, in my neighborhood and I'm an acquaintance of all the property owners. Uh, I don't have, feel that that has any bearing on my ability to um, decision on this uh, without bias. Uh, similarly, on item number 138, I'm an acquaintance of the property owners at 11 Hemlock Hill. Nobody has any concerns with those? Just that um, I believe 142 is also still on the consent agenda. Oh, yes, thank you. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, I would move the consent agenda subject to the two items noted being. Before you do that, I'm gonna ask if anybody uh, wants to comment on anything included in that consent agenda, which is items 136, 137, 138, 139, and 142. And I'll read. One is uh, consideration of drainage easements in the Oakhurst and Wood Roads neighborhood. Another is consideration of drainage and property easements for Scott Dyer Road Phase Two. Another is consideration of drainage easements for Hemlock Hill. Uh, our general assistance appendices, uh, setting that to a public hearing at our November meeting, and then the municipal election warrant is item number 142. Is there anybody here that wishes to speak on any of those items that I just listed? Seeing none, Councilor Gabrielson has moved that we approve that agenda on block. Is there a second? second. Councilor Jordan, is there any discussion? Mm -hmm. Councilor Devereaux. I would just like to say that um, I intend to vote in the affirmative on these because I've reviewed them and the easements all look to be in order. They were taken care of by our town attorney. They were signed by the homeowners. So they all look to be uh, in order and uh, will be important, an important part of what happens with that community there in Oakhurst. As for the general um, assistance appendix, appendices, that's something that we approve yearly and it's, um, it's something that we need to continue approving. It looks like it's fine. And as for the uh, municipal election warrant, uh, I think that's something that we all agree we have elections coming up and it's something that um, I will be voting to approve. Thank you, any other discussion? Particularly on the property easement ones, I wanna um, commend Bob Malley, who's here tonight, uh, for the hard work that he and staff have done on um, uh, working with the property owners um, to come up with acceptable arrangements in all those cases. I know in particular, as I mentioned, one of them is in my neighborhood and a great deal of time and effort and energy was spent on um, not only um, you know, diagnosing issues related to the drainage problems, but then working to secure um, the easements with the property owner. So thank you very much, Bob. Appreciate the time and effort put in on that. Any other discussion of these? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll go to item number 140-2019. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, uh, we're looking to appoint to uh, a committee at the request of the superintendent and school board, two members of the town council, um, that they be uh, members of the committee working on the um, uh, school building uh, needs 
the school building needs that came out of the assessment report um, that has been done to date. Uh, at our workshop uh, last month, it was the consensus of the council that myself and Councillor Adams uh, be named to represent this committee. So I'm looking for a motion to that effect. So Councillor Gableson, is there a second? Councillor Jordan, discussion, Councillor Devereaux. Yes. Um, I don't believe there was consensus at that meeting. Um, I wasn't in consensus with it. And I'd just like to let the public know that we had, again, a workshop, a town council workshop on September 24th. It, um, it began with um, Councillor Garvin beginning the meeting saying that a committee had been formed for the schools to look at the buildings. Previous committee had been formed, which was called the Needs Assessment Committee, and Councillor Garvin and I were both on that committee. Um, as Councillor Garvin began the meeting, he said that uh, he had spoken with the school superintendent and that she had requested that he be on the committee. Um, I have some concerns about that. I don't know if that's appropriate for our superintendent to request or cherry pick um, councillors to be on committees. Second of all, um, looking at our agenda, again it says that Chairman Garvin received a request from Superintendent Wolfram requesting two representatives to serve on this newly formed building committee. Um, it's my understanding, looking at the town, the town charter, that the superintendent um, speaks with our town manager and works out any committees. Also, this is a school committee, not a town council committee. So I'm looking at, um, I'm concerned about our transparency, and I'd like to make sure that we're extremely transparent between the town council and the school. Um, as the meeting went on, um, Councillor Garvin said um, he would like to be a member of that committee, and that um, there was a date in October the 22nd that was a mandatory meeting um, uh, Councillor Straw immediately spoke up and said he felt that he had a conflict. His wife is on the board. Uh, at that time, Councillor Adams spoke up and said that she could not attend that October 22nd meeting. I then spoke up and said I would like to attend it since I would like to be on it since I um, was on the previous committee. And Councillor Garvin stated that the councillor chosen had to not have any children in the school system. I stated that um, my daughter had graduated and was no longer in school. So I don't know who made the rule, whether it was Councillor Garvin or the superintendent. And if we follow that logic, then there's several people on this um, town council table here that should not be voting on our school budget. So um, Councillor Garvin then proceeded to ask um, Councillor Jordan, both the Jordans and Councillor Adams, if they would be on the committee. Councillor Adams reluctantly, um, it seemed that she reluctantly, reluctantly agreed, but she could not attend the mandatory meeting. Um, Councillor Jordan, Penny Jordan, said that she would attend it. I'm very concerned why um, this happened and why it is that my having a child who went through our school system disqualifies me from being on a committee that I was previously on. Um, I attended every meeting. I could attend every meeting. I was a trustee of a four-year college where we went through the same process of looking at buildings and how we were going to add on, build. So I've been through the process. Um, so I'd like to direct the question to Councillor Garvin as to um, why my qualifications aren't um, enough to be on this committee and why someone with, even though he has a child in school and is on the committee, why Mr. Councillor Gabrielson or myself could not be on the committee. Um, I'm happy to respond to you. Um, I am, first of all, extremely surprised by what I feel is a, absolutely a broadside attack uh, on, at me personally. and. Uh, something that frankly completely misrepresents the context and uh, outcome of the workshop that we had. So I'll be happy to address each of these things that you've just laid out here. The first of which is that at a meeting of the finance uh, and, and chairs subcommittee, which is a regularly scheduled meeting, the town manager Sturgis and the superintendent were asked, that's when this committee was presented uh, to us and our participation was requested. 
the superintendent requested that the chairman of chairperson of the council be one of the two, not me specifically. So in so much as that it felt appropriate to her that the chair of both bodies be on that committee, that's what she requested. It's perfectly within the purview of the council to decline that request. As you said, there's nothing in the charter that lets her cherry pick who she wants or doesn't want on the committee. I was simply communicating that the chair of the council was requested. If I somehow misspoke or that was misinterpreted to be that me individually was requested, I apologize for any um, misunderstanding as far as that goes. Similarly, I did not at all state that it was a requirement that one or both of the counselors not have any children in the school. I was simply offering my individual opinion that it would be, it would make the most representative and well-balanced committee if we had a representation of committee members that both did and did not. I think that that personally, you know, as we're here to represent the entire town, that you know, that goes much further towards achieving that representation when you try and have counselors that represent all of that. Lastly, I would say that none of these things were voiced in the workshop itself or to me personally afterwards, at which point I would have been happy to address any of them with you. I feel like your approach here tonight is both grandstanding and frankly inappropriate. And I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that that's how you interpreted um, my position and my management of the meeting. Is there any other discussion? Um, I, I would like to reply. Is there any other discussion? I just would like to add that uh, I at first was reluctant, but um, after having thought about it, this was a, a big issue um, on the council previously with the school budget and looking at the school building needs. Um, and I would like an opportunity to participate in this committee. And I, my schedule has changed, so I will now be available for the October 22nd meeting, which I've conveyed to Council Councilor Garvin. Councilor Jordan. Um, I want to um, reiterate what uh, Chairman Garvin just said, I, I truly believe that if you had an issue, you should have gone to him directly versus using this council meeting as a way to present what I feel, and I was at that workshop, that whenever Councilor Garvin puts anything forward, it's thoughts and ideas. It's a it's his opinion. He doesn't push an agenda. What I heard and what I thought was pretty logical is that yes, it does make sense to balance that committee. And I also heard, just as uh, Chairman Garvin just said, that the superintendent asked for participation of the chairman, not Jamie Garvin. And so I also felt that the two names put forward um, really would be good representatives of the council on that committee. And, uh, and so where I would go at this point in time is making a motion that, um, that Councillor Adams and Chairman Garvin are the representatives on the committee. We already have a motion on the floor uh, to that effect. Is there any other discussion, Councilor Straw? Uh, uh, the, the one aspect of all that that um, piqued my interest is, is this a school committee or a town council committee? And if it's a school committee, I just think the motion perhaps should be that we recommend the, because we technically don't, if it's a school committee, we can't appoint. You get what I'm getting at? So in other words, if, if it's a totally a school committee. That is the motion. Yeah, all right, all right. The motion is that, that Chairman Garvin, Councilor Adams be recommended to be considered to represent the council on the building committee. That is the motion. Is there any other that discussion? Can, so, sorry, so uh, the motion is that they uh, were recommending them to the school board that they be considered as our representatives, right? Is, right now it says a point. Yeah. 
So I, I, I'm, I'm okay with and a yes on recommending um, uh, Garvin and Adams as the appointees. Uh, the language in the agenda which was moved was it be recommend that, count, that Chairman Garvin and Councillor Adams be considered to represent the council on the building committee. Got it, and that's, so that's the motion? Mm -hmm. All right, that's right. Got it, all right. All right, I would just like to respond. Um, I'm sorry that you feel that it's grandstanding. I um, have not seen you since our last workshop meeting. And this was something that I thought about a lot after I um, left the meeting and was um, very disappointed that um, because I had a child in school that I was not someone that could be on the committee even though I had the continuity of being on the committee so, um, and you didn't say whose rule that was or where that came from. I, can I? Councilor uh, Jordan. Well, I, I'd like to finish. Councilor Devereaux. And so um, that was um, disturbing to me and I appreciate your clarification. However, I still disagree. I don't think that is, um, that that should be a qualification of whether a town councilor is on a committee, whether they've had a child in school or not. I. I don't think that that should be um, one of our qualifications. Councilor Jordan. Um, I, this is all I'm gonna say. You could have put forward at that workshop that that is how you felt mm -hmm. and we could have had a conversation about that. It didn't come up. And um, I think that we put forward two people um, that I think can represent the council. I, if you had come forward in that workshop and been as adamant as you are right now, I would have had the conversation, That's but true. you didn't. That's true, I didn't, I didn't. I, I also just wanna reiterate that it was neither presented as a rule or requirement. It was my suggestion or recommendation that the best composition of councilors to be recommended for the committee would be uh, a more balanced re uh, a representation. Is there any further discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Next up is item number 141, implementation steps regarding the comprehensive plan. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, um, so uh, after extensive work on the comprehensive plan uh, the past couple of years, we had a workshop on the 24th where we went through a lot of the detail in that plan, laying out uh, specific items that, um, are considered action items uh, to carry out and implement aspects of that plan. A number of those things are here represented on the agenda tonight regarding specific referral to committees or boards uh, for them to pick up as agenda items. So those are all listed here. Councilor Jordan, you had a concern about um, simply the, a typo or? I have two yeah. things actually. Can One we address the first, the type, just so we can clarify yeah, that? It's at the top, it yeah. says 30 and 82 refer to the ordinance committee. Yeah, which it is should it? be 30 and 86. Well, both 30 and 82 are right there below it. and. I think 86 is a separate item. Okay, okay. So I, I think that's good. Didn't, um, and 51. Existing non-conforming lots, but the 86 was referred also, correct? To ordinance committee? Yes, okay. as, well, as is 51, okay. but okay. I think 30 and 82, because they're, related topically, I think that's why they're grouped there. Oh, so they're okay. both having to do with lot size and infill okay. lots and stuff like that, whereas the others are different specific okay. topics. So it seems are we confusing. good on that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Your second concern, I suspect I know where you're going with this, but go Down ahead. to 86? Okay. Yep. Um, I really think that the uh, way that this is worded is narrower than the conversations we are having. Uh, because this seems to talk a lot about administrative tracking and um, of the, the short um, 
short-term rentals themselves versus what we had talked about in, um, in other meetings is that we're really looking at the ordinance itself. Yes. And so it needs to reflect that we're going broader than what this says. I agree. My recommendation would be that we take 86 out of this list, unless anybody has any concerns with any of the others on the specific list. Um, Councilor Straw? Uh, well, let me actually just finish yeah. that point. Yeah. Actually, so my recommendation would be that we, we take 86 out, address 86 separately, um, and then return to the rest of the list. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, That's fine. Go ahead, Councilor no, Gaberson. I was just going to say, I agree. I, I think, I believe this is the language that comes from the comprehensive. It is, and I was, gonna, exactly. I was going to make that point, so. Then, exactly. But yes, I agree that the, the, the remit to the ordinance committee is now broader than that statement. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, would somebody like to make uh, an amendment? Somebody like to propose an amendment to item number 141? Uh, removing number 86 from the list for, uh, to be dealt with separately. Is there a motion on the table? Uh, is there a motion? No. no. Okay. Um, so I would I would just move then that we. Um, <coughs> it's a long long motion. <laughs> um, I, I move that we refer items 30, 82, 47, 48. 51, 64, and 72 um, as laid out in the draft recommendation. And then we can consider 86 separately. Does that what did you leave out? Just, just 86? 86? Okay. Yeah. So there's a motion to move these to the respective committees and boards uh, as included in the agenda. Is there a second for that? Second. Council Jordan, discussion on that. Yes. Uh, just noting that although I'm voting for this, it's under the understanding that it's going for discussion and consideration at the subcommittees, obviously, um, at which point we may recognize that some of them were going to go a different route. Thank you very much. This, to, to clarify, these are to, to start the work process by all these different um, advisory committees that then will come back with their recommendations to the council, uh, many of which will involve um, hearings. All the meetings are open and to the public and participation is encouraged if you have an opinion on any of these items. So there's a motion and second for approving 30 down the list through 72. Um, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Separately, we have, still have number 86. Um, my recommendation, I'm looking for a motion to uh, refer to the ordinance committee a thorough and comprehensive review of the current short-term rental ordinances, inclusive of the passage here that was already listed because that was the specific action language um, from, from the comp plan, but um, also to include a broader review uh, of the entire ordinance. Exactly. So moved, that's a good one. <laughs> Councilor Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Straw, is there any discussion? Councilor Randall. Um, just for people in the audience and those listening, we've gotten a lot of really good feedback from residents about the short-term rentals. We appreciate it, um, and we would invite anyone who's interested to come to the ordinance meeting once it's scheduled, because that's where we really start working on this stuff. And it's incredibly helpful to have people there who are living in these neighborhoods and can provide us with, with additional insight as we're talking about the ordinance itself. So please do stay in touch. If you have questions about when the meeting is, it will be posted. But the 28th. Oh, right, we have already scheduled it. It's the 28th. <laughs> um, 28th of October. Of October at, it's at 7 o'clock, right? We did that one at 7? Yes. Um, and we really appreciate having feedback, so please do come. Thank you, Council Adams. I agree. Uh, and I, as I said before, I think it'll likely be one of several meetings uh, that the Ordinance Committee has on this. I don't think that this is all going to be dealt with and, and wrapped up in one meeting. If you're not able to participate at the meeting itself, you're more than welcome to continue to send us correspondence. Um, as Councilor Adams said, uh, we've gotten, I don't know, probably about 15 or so emails um, with people, uh, various um, views that are being expressed about um, uh, the existing short-term rental ordinance and changes that they think need to be made and things like that. So um, this is obviously an important issue to a number of people in town and we encourage you to stay actively engaged on it. Um, I'll take your question, yeah. Thank you, just a point yeah. of yeah. Mr. Chairman. Um, just so I understand it, number 86 obviously was extremely limited in its scope and 
this definition. And it sounds like what I'm hearing is that the council has now unilaterally, um, the majority, decided to, in essence, if you will, rewrite that definition and send that to the committee separately. The motion on the floor is to charge the ordinance committee with a complete and thorough review of the existing ordinance. So. My concern is uh, that that wasn't what was originally stated in the definition of 86. It was obviously very narrow in scope regarding administrative tracking. So what you're doing wasn't defined as that. Yeah. Councilor Straw. Uh, so what we had listed for 86 was a draft motion. Uh, the actual subject matter uh, being obviously short-term rental activity. Uh, we're, we're not, to my knowledge, under any obligation to pass only the motion that's listed in the document. We, we, we've put out there to the general public that we are going to be having a motion tonight on a number of things involving implementing the comprehensive plan. One of the things is going to deal with short-term rental activity. Via our discussion that we just had, a majority of us said, well, we don't want it, this draft motion. We want something a little broader with, based on what we'd previously discussed at other public meetings. Uh, so a majority of us, after giving notice from my perspective to the general public that we're going to talk about the comprehensive plan tonight and that, we, that it will include short-term rental activity, rather than adopting the draft motion, we have instead chosen to come up with a new motion that is broader, but nevertheless goes to the same point from my perspective, which is short-term rental activity. Thank you, Chris. Other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Oh, Councilor Devereaux, do you have I, I would just like to say that um, this is a complete and thorough review by the Ordinance Committee. So there'll be uh, input by people, and that's what Councilor Adams was saying, that you can go to the meetings, you can give input. So we'll still, we still want lots of input. We've been getting lots of input. We want more input. And so there'll be more opportunities before an actual ordinance is voted on. So this is just that review process. Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, just quick two points yep. on that, yeah. yeah. So uh, to reiterate that, uh, all this is doing is sending it to a committee for us to have in-depth discussions. It could be that that committee comes back with a recommendation that we make short-term rentals unilaterally allowed with no restrictions whatsoever. We, we don't know what will come out of that committee. We're sending it off, at which point then there will be in-depth discussions. So it's mm -hmm. not like we're, we're, we're not, uh, we're not making major changes tonight. It's just going off to a subcommittee. One other point of order, follow up, and the ordinance committee then decide obviously what the timeline is amongst themselves in terms of how they're going to go forward with the ordinance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
you know, several months long process um, where there will be multiple ordinance committee meetings, probably a, a full town council workshop, ultimately, like I said, a public hearing. I would expect, you know, just guesstimating on the calendar sometime in the first couple of months of 2020. I was told by town officials that the process uh, in its entirety could take anywhere between six months to a year and a half, which mm -hmm. I understand, having been on the prior planning boards and town councils, that that's, you know, uh, a, a good guesstimate, but it's a very wide berth. And for the sake of, uh, I'm sure you can understand the sensitivity of timing for the sake of operators, especially as it relates to effective windows, and especially if there's significant changes versus minor changes. So dating and timing and being upfront about that process in terms of uh, some approximate yep. dating, et cetera, is extremely important to many, many people in Cape Elizabeth. I totally understand that, and this is the, I'm, I, I want to end the back and forth, though, at this point, because we're, we're, we're broken from order here, but um, I, I will say that, as I've seen in other surrounding communities, I suspect that if there are any changes to be made, one of the things that the Ordinance Committee will consider is what the effective implementation date of that is. Um, so when I was just talking about the 30 days post-vote, that's for most general ordinances, but there's plenty of ordinances that the Council will vote on where, um, you know, they'll say this is effective. Um, you know, beginning November 1st or something like that, you know, or, or what have you. Uh, even the parking um, plan that we put into effect at Fort Williams was effective uh, on a certain date. So, um, yeah, motion and a second. Yes. we do have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, next up. Item number 143-2019. Portland Headlight Hardscaping Pedestrian Improvements. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, I see John Mitchell from Mitchell & Associates putting up something on the board over there and uh, getting ready to uh, tell us about the recommendations. Matt, is there anything you want to say to kick this off? Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. As, as Mr. Mitchell is uh, getting ready to present, uh, what we have this evening is uh, bringing forward to the council uh, a plan to install uh, some light hardscaping down at the, uh, at the Portland headlight. Uh, what we've had over many years, I guess, would be a way to describe it as uh, areas that have experienced a high level of traffic, foot traffic that have worn down the grassy areas uh, to the point that uh, you know, we have some irrigation equipment that has been exposed. It's just due to a, a great deal of traffic. And we're trying to make it a better, safer experience as well as address uh, the erosion issues that we have had. Uh, met with John earlier this, well, I guess it'd be the end, middle to the end of summer to, to look at a lot of different uh, opportunities that we may have to, to correct some of the issues that we've engaged down there. Uh, he's come forward with a plan, uh, brought it forward to uh, the State Historical Society where they uh, take a look at that due to the <coughs> historical significance of Portland Headlight, of course. Uh, then following up from there uh, has been, has brought this plan to the Fort Williams Park Committee who's had a chance to take a look at this and review it and have come back in favor of it. And so that's why uh, Mr. Mitchell is here tonight to talk about the elements of the plan. You have a hard copy in front of you uh, that we have this evening. It's also part of the council packet online. So if you'd like to take a look at that and to be able to zoom in, get a little greater level of detail so we can, you can see the elements of which you'd like to discuss. And I think I've said about all of that. That was a good overview, thank you. <laughs> thank <laughs> Thanks, you, Mr. Mitchell. Nice to see you, John. Thank you. Um, John Mitchell, Mitchell Associates, representing the town <coughs> for this project. <coughs> so uh, just to repeat a couple items that Matt indicated, in 2001, <clears throat> there was a, uh, a site improvement project around the Fulton Headlight uh, that included walkways, viewing areas, and some plantings. And this was a site plan was developed, it went to planning board, it got approved uh, as, a, as a site plan. So since then, um, there have been, I think everybody realizes there's been a significant increase in the number of visitors to this area, uh, partly due to the number of tour buses that visit Fort Williams and also um, the introduction of the cruise ships to Portland. 
so this project focus, focuses on enhancing and um, upgrading uh, some of the pedestrian areas, particularly the viewing areas. Um, there are, I've labeled, there are three viewing areas, one, two, and three. <coughs> and as Matt indicated, um, a lot of the grass areas uh, within these viewing areas has just been overrun and it's bare ground. Um, and there's actually some erosion that takes place during uh, heavy rain events in this viewing area here. Uh, there were no pavers in this area here. Uh, it was all grass, and a large part of that is uh, in bare ground now. So we've de developed a uh, paved area where pedestrians uh, congregate to view and photograph, um, and then this would be grass areas, a grass area here. Um, and then viewing area two and three um, incorporates, or did in the original site plan, uh, some lawn areas and limited the paved areas around the, primarily around the uh, fence area. So we've decided to remove uh, what was lawn and uh, make it all papers. Uh, also included in this project um, would be uh, relocation of the horn. There's a, there's a horn uh, pedestal that is secured to a uh, concrete slab. That um, not only is it in a dangerous location because there are kids that get on the horn, they climb the horn, it's on a very steep uh, embankment right here. So we've decided to move the horn in this location here, which is a fenced in location, and I'm told that it was actually the original location of the horn. So we've done that. Um, uh, we've also used uh, the bollard and chain. They're very small uh, metal posts with, with chains to help uh, prevent pedestrians from walking on grass areas. We've done that. Um, we've done a small amount of plantings and we've got one wood bench up next to the, the gift shop. Um, as Matt also indicated, we have received approval from the Maine Historic Preservation Commission on this design. Uh, we've also received approval from the Fort Williams uh, Committee, Fort Williams Park Committee. So um, I guess what we are asking the council this evening is a uh, recommendation to go to planning board to go to workshop first and then a regular meeting. Any questions? Thank you, John. Any questions for John? <coughs> Councilor Everill? So, so you're removing all of the grassy areas, then we won't have any grassy areas there. Is that what I'm hearing? We're removing these two grass areas that are here, that are now bare ground. Mm -hmm. uh, we are incorporating grass in this area. Here. Oh, it'll be incorporated. Okay. Yes. Other questions? Discussion? I like the source of the funds. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we need a motion. Uh, that authorizes the town manager to refer the uh, improvements as just presented to us with the funding as presented. Is there a motion? So Council Gabrielson, is there a second? Yes, Council Devereaux, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Next up is another Fort Williams item, number 144, proposed commercial vehicle fees at Fort Williams Park. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Please come forward. Your name and either address or affiliation and uh, keep your remarks to about three minutes if you could. You got it. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Bill Frappier, resident of Scarborough. Uh, my wife, Kathy, and I own Portland Discovery Land and Sea Tours, the trolley company and uh, the boat tour company in Portland. Uh, so we've been visiting Fort Williams since 1995 uh, as part of our tour. I'm um, a little late to the party. We're wrapping up a busy cruise ship season, as you all know, I'm quite sure. Uh, so 
I just got word about the change in fees uh, just a day or two ago. I haven't been involved in any discussion uh, as a stakeholder prior to that. So I was just curious. I don't even know what the process is, but I guess my hope is that there's going to be some more discussion before uh, it is finally voted on. And if so, I guess I need to find out how I become part of that conversation. That is really all I had to say. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the public that wishes to speak on this? Um, I'll just respond to the questions that you asked. Uh, I can't remember what month um, this came up last fall. Um, the council had previously uh, voted um, to uh, increase, um, increase substantially the uh, commercial bus uh, and uh, other commercial vehicle fees at the fort. Um, the Fort Williams Park Committee had come forward to us with a recommendation that the council at the time um, actually went above that recommendation and, and voted to, to implement uh, a new fee schedule. Um, we, at that point, heard from several other uh, commercial operators um, that gave us a little bit more information and context to um, how they set their contracts and things like that and expressed that uh, there was a lot more lead time that they thought was needed and appropriate um, to be able to try and implement the types of changes that we were, um, that we were uh, forecasting uh, with our, the direction of our vote. So we pulled back somewhat for this season, um, and, but at that time, signaled quite clearly in our discussion um, that we were looking for the committee to come back to us with a stepped and graduated um, uh, fee plan um, that got us up to what we feel is a more appropriate um, uh, revenue uh, model for the, for the service that's being offered, basically, or being made available. Um, so that's what the, the timing has been on that. So I. I I, it's, it sounds like you'd not been aware of or, or heard of any of that, so um, apologize that you weren't, you know, aware of that earlier. But that was sort of that's sort of the context and background for how we got to here today. So, um, so before us, uh, we have the. Proposal that the Fort Williams Park Committee came back to, which uh, looks at recommended fees for the next three years. Um, we don't have a specific, specific recommended action on this tonight. Um, we can vote to approve it as is. We can vote to refer this to a workshop to discuss. We can uh, vote to uh, alter the fee schedule as presented. Um, looking to the council for their desired action here. Mr. Chairman, if, yep. it, if it may Go be ahead, hel helpful to the, to the council as well. Uh, this was a follow-up, obviously, from the spring and the conversations that took place during the budgetary season, but also from conversations with the council over the course of the summer to say, okay, we need to have a recommendation from the park committee. So I expressed that to the chairman of the park committee, and he took it up with the with the committee over the past, I, I believe, the past two meetings where they where they reviewed it, and or actually, sorry, September's meeting where they reviewed it and brought that forward for for the council. They're meeting again tomorrow night uh, as well. Uh, but what they wanted to do was, as you had said, Mr. Chairman, get it get early onto the curve versus later where folks, uh, specifically that I know the large uh, motor coach operators. Uh, had expressed a, a great amount of concern. Uh, they were at the last meeting for the park committee and they were aware of this change and, and felt that it was a decent change for them. So uh, I guess that's why they brought this forward this evening and following up from the council's uh, you know, request that they do A, have the numbers earlier and B, come forward with a recommendation and a plan for the next three years, which was also expressed to them. So that's why, that's why you have this here this evening. Uh, I'm comfortable with it as is, given that the Park Commission put a lot of time into it. They did involve a number of the tour operators, it sounds like, and my understanding is that they had previously indicated they wanted um, uh, some amount of uh, lead time. Um, 
with the fee, so I'm fine with it as presented. And would just note that in considering and thinking about these fees, to the extent anyone needs to explain it to uh, individuals they're working with, uh, we spent a hundreds of thousands of dollars rebuilding the parking lot. Um, and we have quotes for rebuilding Shore Road that are running in the million dollar range. Uh, all of which the traffic going up and down Shore Road into the park plays a, a, a role in. So. Oh, sorry. I wasn't that's sure. it. That's I just it. Had a question. <laughs> I'm done. If, what, one other item I had, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yep. Uh, on the back side of your sheet there and what you had in the, in the council agenda, there was a request at the time for the uh, committee to look it on a, like a per head basis. Mm -hmm. So you could break that down for the council because I know there was a request from, I think it was Councilor Gabrielson who had asked for the park committee to do that form of analysis. And that's why uh, you have that, that breakdown as well. It's, and kind of the rationale as to how they kind of backed into the numbers and the recommended amounts that they were that they were looking at. And then on the front would just be an update of the existing schedule that, that the committee had been using, uh, just advancing for those other three years. Councilor Adams. Um, I get, I'm, I'm generally comfortable with the direction we're heading in, but I do have some questions for the Fort Williams Park Committee about how they arrived at these numbers. So I, I would prefer to refer this to a workshop, but also being cognizant of the fact that we do want to get this done quickly. I don't think it would take much time, but I just have some questions for their process. Other thoughts on that discussion? I agree. I'd like to know what their process was and how they um, uh, counted up the visits per day for the trolley. And I'm, I'm kind of concerned that the trolley is um, a set fee for three years where the commercial vehicles um, is an increasing fee, which seems very appropriate. Um, but my thought is with the trolleys, and we can talk to the person who um, runs the trolley service. They may be adding more trolleys, there may be more people, so I don't know if we vote on this now that in three years from now that, that number would be accurate. I'm not sure I'm following the point you're making about. Well, what they're saying is um, uh, it would be $30,000 for a season pass for the trolleys for three years, each year. No. no. It's 7,000 in 2020, 11,000 in 2021, and 15,000 in 2022. Oh, I'm looking at the season pass down here. So we need to just change the second. This was an alternative. This section. It just seems that if there's between 24,000 and 37,000 trolley visitors a year, and at $1 a person, that would average 30,000 a year, but yet we're looking at um, a proposal of 7,000. Can I make a motion? Yeah. I move that uh, uh, Before you do, oh, Councilor Jordan wanted to make a point. No, no okay. Mind. okay. Matt, did you want to clarify something? If, if I may, if you look on the uh, on the schedule that looks yep. like this, uh, down, you'll notice under, on the third line below, kind of breaks down the rationale. Uh, that currently there's one trolley company with two trolleys. On the average, is eight visits per day with 18 passengers per visit. So you have 209 days, they estimate, over the course of a season, uh, eight visits and then times 18 passengers, that's how they backed another 30,000 visitors. So that's the rationale that was employed there. On the back, you'll notice the red, uh, we have two, uh, two estimators involved in the uh, estimating of traffic volumes. Uh, JK2 would be Jim Kearney, and KK2 would be Chris Cutter, uh, our, our park coordinator. So this is based on their experience in being in the park. Chris, especially on a, on a multiple day basis, I would say. Uh, I think that's KK would be you, Chris. I, I wasn't involved in that. Oh, okay. Pardon me? Oh, it could be. Okay, oh, sorry. Carrie Curtis. CC, Chris Cutter, KK, Carrie Curtis. Okay. 
<laughs> pardon, pardon my uh, trying to involve okay. the shorthand, but this was based off their experience with uh, looking at traffic volumes on a on a se on the seasonal basis, and that's how they broke into the into the number of visitors, and and then uh, you know looking at and they did know what the estimated. Uh, Average ticket prices were based from experience and, 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 and you know, research, and that's kind of how they backed into that number. So uh, that's why they came forward with the recommendation that they had because they felt it was reasonable, but it wasn't, uh, you know, it still wasn't going too far into the the extreme extreme side of it. And that's why they felt they, you know, it is doubling from where they were, mm -hmm. but they felt that the the 3,000 was artificially too low in comparison to what the volume of, of visitors that that were coming through. Okay. And so specifically to try to tease out these numbers a little bit more, so what they end up having, but then it doesn't take into account the growth over the next few years, is what the season pass times two is assuming $15,000 and then two season passes, so they're plugging in the 2022 numbers is my understanding, yeah. and justifying it that way. Um, but yeah, it doesn't take into account whatever growth may occur over the next three years, but that always seems to be the case with a lot of this is, and it's all guesstimates as well. Who knows, maybe the economy collapses and people keep stop coming to Fort Williams. Um, but, I, so I'd, I'd make a motion. Um, so hold on to that oh, point though. Sorry. Are, are these, so just to clarify for everybody's benefit, um, this is per vehicle though, right? So when, when you're making the point about there's one trolley company with two trolleys, though, this is this is per trolley though, right? It would no. be. Yeah. It's a pass, I thought. Yeah, but f f per pass for the trolley. Yeah. Right, so to address your point, Councilor okay. Devereaux, that well, what if there's more trolleys added? Then there's more, okay. there's more passes issued. So that that should be a dynamic number regardless. Okay. Same thing with any of the other vans, limos, tour operators, things like that. It's not it's not per company. It's it's right. per vehicle. Okay, that's great. Yep, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Adams. Matt, do you? I don't know if you know the answer to this. Um, is the per person ticket price for a trolley similar to what it is for the other vehicles? Did they consider that sort of thing? That I cannot answer. I don't know the answer to that question. Say that again, Council Adams. I was just wondering whether the breakdown, like the per, per ticket, essentially, or per head price for the trolley um, is similar to the other modes of transportation. Or whether some, because there's also a note about maybe um, this will alter alter behavior in favor of investing in minibuses. Are we trying to encourage minibuses over trolleys? Go ahead. I mean, no, that was just that was just. Uh, I think that's just a postulate uh, postulation, just to see, thinking out loud, will that may in, inspire other modes of vehicles. What's that? Can I answer any of these? Uh, if I anybody has any direct questions, by all means. Uh, with the ticket prices, I was just going to know we've uh, note we've heard that they're all over the map. There's both the price to the end consumer versus the price that the vendor actually receives because they're a middleman, and then the buses are anywhere from we've heard anything from like twenty something a seat to forty something a seat. So it, it's all over the place. So I just mean yeah. our our ticket price that uh, we if, if we charge. Set. Uh, in translating that to how much we're in effect charging per seat. Ah, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I'm just struggling to do the math off the top of my head. <laughs> no. Any other questions, discussion, points? Still no motion on the table. Uh, so I, I would, I'm ready to vote, but at the same time, it sounds like there's a lot of questions people have outstanding. So for that reason, I'd say we, I move that we uh, send this to a uh, workshop with the Fort Williams Park Commission in the near future. Motion to refer this to workshop. Is there a second? I would second. Councilor Adams, is it, any discussion? Other discussion, Council Devereaux? What are we asking them to do? Um, what do we want them to do? 
my understanding is that we want them to come to our next workshop that this will be on the agenda for to have us talk to them more about how they arrived at these particular rates and any additional thoughts that went into coming up with this fee schedule. Councilor Stroh. And a key aspect of all this is uh, this time around, we've now laid out potential rates for the next three years. So if anyone is watching this at home that's involved in the industry or otherwise in the audience, uh, we're now discussing this. We have something proposed for the next three years that's laid out. So hopefully you won't feel as blindsided this year. Yeah. Even Councilor, if it takes another month to do this. Okay. Councilor Adams. Um, I, I was just gonna say in terms of scheduling, um, I know our next workshop, I just looked at the calendar, is also our caucus. But I don't know if other counselors would be open to meeting earlier. Maybe, so we can, because I, I know last year, or in the spring when they came to us, one of the issues was the timing, so I just wanna make sure that we do what we can to get to this quickly so that everyone can plan ahead for the next season. So we don't have another workshop till late November? We have one in mid-November that follows the oh, okay. election on the 5th, and that that is usually um, the caucus, the caucus uh, for um, determining uh, leadership and things like that. Um, I agree with you. I would like to do it sooner rather than later. I have no objection to scheduling an additional workshop, um, either later this month or in the early part of November prior to that. So. I agree. Um, I agree. Ms. Chairman, is there, yep. is there any desire to have a workshop on the 28th, which is an open open evening? I do know that the... Uh, the what date? On October 28th. October 28th is the Ordinance Committee meeting. Oh, it is, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Darn it. Don't, don't uh, double book me. Uh, I know, I'm trying. Oh, shoot, okay. Would it be possible to put this as the first agenda item on the workshop on the 12th and then just have the caucus following this agenda item? The 14th, you mean? I'm sorry, yes. Um, we have the appointment committee um, meeting before our workshop that day. That's um, the date we set for our um, annual appointments. Um, we set that at six o'clock before the the uh, town council workshop on that day. I think you were just talking about at the regularly scheduled time, have it be the first item and then excuse the counselors. Uh, if, if there are counselors that are not gonna be part of the next council, um, that they would be excused or not. They're still part of the council. They'd be right. welcome, yeah. but they, they don't participate in the caucus, but. So we could, we could do that. We could use the existing date of the 14th. Um, I, my only concern with that is that it's following our regular meeting on the 13th. I would have, I would have preferred to bring this back to vote on at the 13th. So um, if we can find a date preceding that, that would be preferable to me. Um, Agree. The 6th of November? 6th. That would work for me. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, yep. uh, one thought could be uh, not to be presumptuous towards the council, but yep. we would put that in as an item to have on the November uh, 13th council agenda, thinking that the council would be able to get the information that they may need to make an informed or, or more comfortable decision on the following week. So if we could, we would post that agenda that day on the 6th uh, for the meeting on the 13th and then You'd have that to be able to be acting on it the following week, if that if that would please the council. That's a good idea. Does the six work? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. works. Yeah. So, can I amend my motion to make it to send it to workshop on November sixth? That'd be great. Seven o'clock. Sounds good. Great. <laughs> so moved. Any other discussion? <laughs> so we will. Uh, all those in favor? So. Wednesday, November 6th, seven o'clock um, in this building, likely Jordan Conference Room. We will discuss that. Hopefully there's folks from the Fort Williams Committee that are able to be there. Well, to, you know, to, to be honest, Jim, uh, speaking with Jim Walsh and Jim Kearney in advance of, this, of the meeting, uh, felt that this was really just an update to what the council had already asked for. And uh, I, uh, 
that had indicated to Jim uh, that yep. I was just going to go through. So I, was, uh, I apologize for adding you an extra meeting. So no, I I, I think it's fine to take the extra step. Um, so we'll do that. It is a good opportunity to talk to them about the uh, master planning as well, because I know they wanted to have a workshop with council, so the sooner uh, you could double, one of, double yeah, one that. Yeah, to them. Okay, uh, next item is number 145-2019, consideration of accepting purchase of a parcel of land in conjunction with the Hemlock Hill drainage project. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none. Matt, do you want to give us a little background here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, what we have this evening for action on the council is uh, looking to purchase a 1.62 acre piece of land, which is the uh, uh, a portion of a piece of land that is owned by Mr. and Mrs. Bennett on uh, on map U3354B. The parcel is located on uh, on, on Oakhurst Road. Uh, it's kind of uh, it's it's part of a larger parcel that they own. They're still remaining owner in ownership of a portion of that that remains uh, but this is to help us do a, uh, a stormwater uh, management uh, approach right now if you were to drive over to hemlock hill you would notice a, a nice new fresh coat of base paving that's down as well as some new installations of some uh, of drainage infrastructure that's there uh, we've Earlier in the council's uh, agenda, you voted on easements uh, from the Clancy's and the branches uh, that are part of this uh, part of this project. However, uh, in, or, in order to dispose of all of our water onto this additional land, uh, we're looking at purchasing this parcel from the Bennetts uh, in order to have a place for that stormwater to final, find its final resting place before it uh, is absorbed by the earth and uh, evaporates. So that's kind of why uh, we brought this forward. Uh, we started with the the prior owners. Bob actually reminded me today that this discussion goes back to 2010 uh, when uh, this project was uh, initially started to be thought of. And uh, we've been working on this for a very long time, but now uh, with a great amount of work from Mr. Malley, as well as uh, Tom Leahy and Mr. and Mrs. Bennett and Mr. and Mrs. Bennett's attorney, we've come forward with this quick claim deed, as well as the language that's uh, that's acceptable to, to both parties. Uh, their concern was that you know we didn't want to have anything built on it as far as the structure if something ever changed. It's all pretty much an RP or resource protection land anyhow. So uh, what we're looking to do tonight is to get the council to approve us to purchase the land as well as uh, pay for any legal expenses that come with the uh, cost of the transaction not to exceed $1,500, which was a, a fair estimate by both attorneys uh, to, to help get us across the finish line. Thank you, Matt, for that explanation. Is there a motion? Uh, to approve the purchase as just outlined by Matt. So moved. Councilor Devereaux, is there a second? Councilor Jordan, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great. Next up is item number 146-2019. I previously notified the manager and uh, finance chair that I uh, need to recuse myself from this item due to a personal friendship with the applicants here. Uh, so I'm gonna stand down for this one. If you don't mind, I'll just continue from right here, unless, <laughs> all right. Uh, so next up on the agenda uh, is, is item 146-2019, 21 Ivy Road, tax acquired parcel. Uh, first off, uh, is there anyone from the public that would like to make any comments on this item? Seeing none, uh, now, Matt, could you give us a little bit of a background into this? In particular, how in the world did the town end up with yeah. a <laughs> disconnected little sub-chunk of land within a subdivision plan? I would be happy to, Council yeah. Straw, thank you. Uh, this parcel is what you call an erratic, I guess would be <laughs> the best way to describe it. Going back, and uh, well, Dr. and Mrs. Halter purchased their house about 14 years ago on Ivy Road and life was fine up until uh, earlier this summer when they decided to have the property surveyed in advance of some uh, construction they were thinking of doing on their property. During the, tr during the process of having their property uh, surveyed, they, were found, uh, they found that their, what, what they had always considered their side and backyard had a lovely uh, oddball shaped parcel that is currently being assessed and owned by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Back somewhere along the lines of when they just uh, did the, the plan for that neighborhood and, and chopped the lots up, uh, someone forgot to include this part of the description in, in a lot. So it was kind of an orphaned parcel that, that sits out there. Uh, 
I read through the deeds, went through the old plans, and looked at all the survey work, and found that this was what they, was called part of Lot 101 uh, that existed out there. Well, the assessor at the time, being a good assessor, went in <laughs> and found that there was a piece of land that existed on the face of the earth and assessed it to the owner of the original development. The owner of the original development never paid any taxes on it, and therefore, over the course of times, roughly around 1955, it was foreclosed upon for non-payment of property taxes, and everything was fine for the next 65 years. <laughs> Until tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I went over, I've spoken with Maureen O'Mara, the town planner. There is absolutely no interest whatsoever by the Conservation Committee to do anything with this land because it, it is basically Dr. and Mrs. Halter's side yard. Then you also have, uh, I spoke with Bob Malley. We went over there and physically looked at the parcel. You can see it, it's got a lovely piece of ledge sticking out from it with some grass over the top and is currently has no use for stormwater, drainage, any infrastructure, no municipal use whatsoever going forward. Uh, that's why tonight brought forward the recommendation that the parcel be quick claim deeded to Dr. and Mrs. Halter. Uh, they were uh, happy enough to help get you know, pay the town's legal expenses that do come forward with the transaction to get it transferred over to them and so they can go on with their lives and actually it may be worth more to the town from the tax revenue it generates than it will be by any re remuneration that the town would receive. So that's why we brought this forward tonight with a recommendation to, to, to uh, as it exists. Thank you for that background. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mouthful. Uh, so any discussion at this point uh, on the topic? Any questions for the town manager? All right, um, so I, I guess a key aspect that you touched on there, just given the fact that we just voted for um, a $10,000 transaction for a little over an acre, this is a much smaller chunk. As you noted, it's a, it's not a actual lot, it's a circular, it, a, a oblong shape of land within someone else's lot. Mm -hmm. um, and as you noted, the, uh, do we have any guesstimate as to the, the, the fair market value? Is it de minimis um, such that we can kind of check our boxes and say, give it, they're, they're in effect paying the legal fees to cover it. Is that sufficient to compensate the town? Based on the amount of square footage that, that is being transferred, that's, I think that's a fair, fair exchange. Right. Yeah, this, it's very de minimis because there's no access and it's literally as I was talking to staff today about the size of the table area that we have in the Jordan Conference room when it's fully <laughs> constructed. So it's really, uh, it's really an oddball piece. With all that, uh, I'm looking for a motion. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, looking for a motion uh, that the town council convey the town owned property identified in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds as part of lot 101 and identified in the town assessing records as map U04 lot 022 to Julie Halter via municipal quick claim deed and as compensation all legal expenses related to the transaction be paid for by Dr. Jeffrey and Julie Halter, 21 Ivy Road. In addition, the town manager is authorized to sign a quick claim deed on behalf of the town as drafted and deeded accepted, acceptable uh, by the town attorney. I so move. And a second. I'll second that. Right. Right. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? None opposed. It's unanimous. With that, I turn it back over to the town chair. Next item is number 147-2019, consideration of authorizing the Energy Committee to entertain requests for proposals for a solar project on the town's landfill. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak on this? Nope. Um, so as we discussed at our workshop uh, last, uh, a little more than a week ago, um, the Energy Committee has come forward with um, a couple of different recommendations. Um, the most pressing of which is an opportunity to pursue installation of uh, solar arrays uh, at the uh, cap landfill uh, adjacent to the recycling center. Um, the outcome of our workshop was that we uh, were in agreement that this was a good opportunity and the next good step would be for the Energy Committee to uh, draft and work with the town on the issuance of an RFP uh, to that effect. Uh, so I'll be looking for a motion to do just that. So moved. Councillor Adams, is there a second? 
Councilor Jordan, any discussion? Councilor Gabrielson. I'm curious, um, so I, I think the Energy Committee's done an excellent job pulling together information on this. Their presentation was very thorough and, and uh, I think it's, I'm excited to have, see the town move forward with this. Um, do we have a sense um, of what the timeline for pulling together an RFP might be and then I, I presume that the RFP would then come back to the council for adoption or are we authorizing the town manager to issue that RFP? Uh, I believe we're authorizing the issuance of it tonight, um, which I agree with. Um, I don't think we need, it needs to come back to us. Um, what would come back to us as we discussed at our workshop is uh, the Energy Committee will work to review uh, the responses to the proposals that they get um, and parse those out and come back to the Council f with a recommendation uh, on a specific proposal, if there is one to move forward with, and that we would then um, authorize that. So, other discussion? Councilor Straw. I just want to thank the Energy Committee for all their hard work on this and also for sitting through our meeting until this point <laughs> in the evening. So, thank you all. Uh, agreed. This is really exciting in my view and um, is the result of um, some really great. Um, uh, volunteered expert time and, and talent. Uh, you know, when we talked at the beginning of the meeting about uh, openings on committees and things like that, uh, here's a good example of, of one that uh, has produced some great work and we're thankful for that. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Next up is another energy committee item, uh, number 148-2019. Uh, Filling an unexpired term on the Energy Committee. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none. Um, having received the resignation of a previous uh, committee member, Jennifer Healy, who we thank for her service on the committee, uh, it is the recommendation uh, of the Appointments Committee to appoint John Volts uh, to the Energy Committee for a term that will expire 12 31 2020. Is there a motion to that effect? Sure. Councillor Adams, is there a second? So moved. Councilor Straw, any discussion? I'd just like to thank uh, uh, John Voltz and others who are interested in this uh, and uh, seeing no other discussion, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Next up is number 149-2019, State of Maine Bicentennial Celebration Committee charge. Uh, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none, uh, as we again referenced at the beginning of the meeting, uh, we're looking to establish a bicentennial celebration committee. Um, the charge is included uh, here tonight. Uh, so is there a motion to approve the committee charge for the ad hoc committee, uh, ad hoc main bicentennial celebration committee? So moved. Councilor Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Devereaux, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Unanimous. Item number 150-2019, Registration Appeals Board nominations. Anybody from the public wishing to speak on this? Seeing none. Uh, we're required by main statute um, to have a uh, uh, Registration Appeals Board. Uh, and that board consists of three members and two alternates, representation of each of the major political parties. The nominations are here on our agenda tonight. The Democratic Town Committee has nominated Kimberly Monahan. Uh, with an alternate of Karen Hessel. The Republican Town Committee has nominated Tim Thompson with an alternate of Nancy Thompson. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to confirm the nominations to the Registration Appeals Board as presented. I so move. Councilor Devereaux, is there a second? Councilor Adams, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Next is item number 151-2019, Metro Regional Coalition Council Resolution. Seeing nobody from the public wishing to speak on this, um, we discussed at our workshop uh, about 10 days ago or so um, uh, uh, with Chris Hall from the Greater Portland Council of Governments, uh, an initiative that's being undertaken by GP COG um, to ask uh, regional councils and governing bodies um, to make a commitment um, towards uh, helping the, to improve and, and, and uh, to make improvements in the regional housing crisis. Um, so we've been asked to consider adopting a resolution uh, regarding our commitment to that effect. 
Chris, uh, I'm sorry, Jeremy, you're uh, our appointee to the Metro Coalition. Was there anything that you wanted to add to this? Um, not specifically. Great. Matt, you want to Chairman, yeah. if I may, you'll, you will notice on one item uh, or a couple of subtle changes or changes that did take place within the resolution uh, towards the bottom of it where uh, Mr. Hall, when he did make his presentation to the council at the workshop, uh, saying that the council should put its local flair on it. So uh, working with Maureen O'Meara, the town planner, uh, brought forward the language specific to this element uh, from the comp plan. And that's why you see, uh, as you get to the bottom, pretty much the last whereas is expanded to incorporate two of those different uh, recommendations that came from the comp plan. And that's, uh, and that's where you see that that differs from the original one. And uh, if you see any typos, please uh, forgive me because uh, uh, I, I rewrote it, didn't have it in the word. <laughs> I think we, I captured them all. But uh, that is the two elements that we did add towards the end, which is uh, to give it more of a, a, a Cape Elizabeth bend versus what might work for a different one of the other communities in the Metro Regional Coalition. You're missing an S after household, oh. the fourth whereas, but <laughs> I was going to bite my tongue since you opened it up. That's okay. <laughs> we, can make that, we can make that change. Any other discussion? Jeremy, would you like to make a motion? I would. I move that the council adopts the uh, resolution on um, affordable housing uh, as presented in the agenda. So your second. I'll second. All right. Any discussion? I have a question. Uh, Are folks reading or? <laughs> I have a question about uh, undertaking a housing diversity study. Is that something that our town will undertake or is that something that the coalition is undertaking? That the town will, that was from our comp plan. Yep. Both, the, both these items are directly under the comp plan. I understand, however, it says um, undertake um, a housing diversity study with the goal of completing by 2025. So, um, okay, no further questions. Construct. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's kind of a, uh, it's a resolution. It isn't something necessarily etched sure. in stone, but um, we, the comp plan has the other ideas. Like we, I think it incorporated the cottage development plans and mm -hmm. things like that. So there, there were other, uh, proposed solutions in the comp plan that this doesn't capture, but it's it's a resolution, so I'm fine with it as written, so. And if I may, yep. um, having recently attended the Metro Region Coalition meeting where we discussed ongoing goals for that group, um, continue, a continued focus on meeting the region's housing needs is, is gonna be part of the work of that, so I expect that likely other ideas will emerge as part of that process. The idea here is really to just get all of the communities that are in the region um, to make a statement recognizing that we understand that this is a problem and committing to take some action to address it. That's kind of where we're at at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I think there will be more to come. Okay. Any other discussion? I, I like the last part of it where we're actually stating the resolution, which I think frames it to, as, you know, we'll be adopting and improving policies and incentives in our community, but it also then says to contribute to achieving the overall regional goal, because as we discussed at that meeting, I think Penny brought this up, that this may not be attainable necessarily within the structure of our community, but we do want to do what we can to improve access to housing generally. Thank you. Councilor Jordan. Um, I, I'm in support of this res of the resolution. I always just ask the question, how do we make it live? Um, how do we make it part of uh, what we do? 
And so how do we keep it in front of ourselves as uh, we're making decisions? And I just throw that out. I, it could be an unanswerable question, but um, I would hate to see for this to sit on a shelf because this is a critical problem that needs to be solved in the area. So it's like we have to figure out a way to have it live somehow. You want to say something? If I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you may, and I was going to add something too, but go ahead. Sure. Just uh, as, as Mr. Holland said last week, and I know from the, being involved with the Metro Regional Coalition, I think this is one of their touchstones okay. uh, that they're looking at. So I think so it'll we'll, keep coming back. It'll keep us. coming back. This is aspirational, and what they're looking at is to have the, the communities of the Metro Regional Coalition uh, take up this resolution and then bring this forward from a, a legislative advocacy side as well. So I think this is just step one, I think, in a very long uh, process, but one that is, uh, has been endorsed by, by the board to move forward and, and to keep awesome. this as a, okay. as a significant regional issue because it doesn't seem to be uh, going away anytime soon. Good. The thing I was just gonna add is that in two months time, we'll be coming up on developing our 2020 okay. goals, um, which I think this would be an appropriate thing to um, insert into that as well. So, awesome. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Thank you. Last item tonight is number 152-2019, authorization for a banking relationship. Seeing nobody from the public here to speak on this, um, town manager and the finance director. Um, have come to us with the recommendation of working with Katahdin Trust Company. Um, Matt, do you want to talk about this briefly? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be uh, brief on this. Uh, we had some maturing uh, in, uh, CDs that were coming forward and ready to be renewed. Uh, through our finance director and myself, we went out to RFP uh, to solicit uh, responses from all local banks as well as uh, uh, throughout, throughout the region as well as throughout the state of Maine to have them provide us with a proposal. Uh, we received responses from seven different banks. Katahdin Trust came back with the strongest uh, with the strongest offer at 1.86% for the 12 months. And so uh, that was the, uh, the, the, I guess you call the actual high bidder that we did receive. So that's why we made the recommendation to establish a relationship with Katahdin Trust and then uh, to move $5.2 million over into there for a CD for 12 months. Great. Is there a motion to uh, authorize entering into this agreement? So moved. Councilor Straw, is there a second? Councilor Adams, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. That's unanimous. Seeing nobody here to speak about anything <laughs> that was not on our agenda, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Councilor Jordan, second? Councilor Adams, all in favor? We're adjourned. Awesome. Um,